Hi, my name is Eric Demora, founder and CEO at Cartesi. Cartesi is a project that started in early 2018 with the objective to make the apps easier to build and much more powerful. We have been building a blockchain agnostic second layer infrastructure that allows the apps to uh, move intensive computation over massive amounts of data off chain while retaining decentralization and the same security guarantees of the underlying blockchain. Also, uh, all the data involved can remain private among the uh, interested parties in the application. Well, so far, uh, there are quite a few projects that, that are also attaining these uh, features in one way or another. But what really sets Cartesi apart is the fact that the app logic can actually be built using mainstream traditional software stacks on a real operating system. So actually we provide a Linux runtime environment where the DApp logic can run. So you can use mainstream software stacks and also um, OS resources like the file system. That's quite unique, especially if you compare this to the very limited um, runtime environments and language, let's say, of Solidity, in which developers even struggle to convert numbers to string. Now, um, a few weeks ago, we released the alpha version of our first product, the Descartes SDK. The Descartes SDK uh, is a product that provides superpowers to Ethereum, the apps, and smart contracts. So uh, smart contracts are able to specify a computation in the form of a full Linux OS and program that runs within it. And uh, this computation will run by the cart nodes that uh, are run by the interested parties themselves. So actually the DApp developer can choose a set of nodes that will run and verify computation of chain. Typically uh, the, uh, the, the nodes will be run either by the DApp user themselves or by people or organizations that they trust. The important thing about the way that these nodes achieve consensus of chain is that as long as we have at least one honest node, uh, the honest node is always able to ensure that the correct results of the computation is persisted on chain. So we have a way now that's already available that smart contracts on Ethereum are able to specify these complex and intensive computations to run off chain while retaining decentralization and the security guarantees of the main chain. So here's a graphical representation of, of what I just said. Uh, you have a DApp uh, contract that's able to specify the computation uh, and the Descartes nodes that are involved run this computation of chain. Uh, sorry, a claimer node presents the results to the blockchain and the other validating nodes are able to verify uh, the claim uh, presented, and if one of the nodes see that the claim is false, that node is able to start a dispute and enforce that the correct result is persisted on chain. So, um, at the heart of the Cartesian node, we can find our VM, which is called the Cartesian machine. The Cartesian machine emulates a RISC-5 ISA and is able to boot an entire Linux OS. It is deterministic, reproducible, and self-contained. Uh, these are uh, fundamental properties to make sure that uh, consensus is achieved. Uh, the other important feature is that the Cartesian machine is transparent and it's able to produce a Merkle tree root hash uh, of, these, of its entire estates and also Merkle proofs of parts of the state that show that the part of the state is consistent with, uh, with uh, the, the, the full state hash. It also is able to prove that the execution of one single micro microprocessor instruction advances the, uh, the machine uh, from one state to the next 
and from one hash represent the states to the next state hash. This is very important because we also need a mirror implementation of the RIS-5 ISA uh, in order for the blockchain to verify the proof that one instruction actually takes uh, the uh, one state to the next state, which is fundamental for the dispute resolution protocol. Uh, finally, uh, when the developer is creating uh, their dApp, uh, they need to provide a Cartesian machine template. It's basically uh, a template that receives uh, a ROM specification, a RAM image that will contain typically the, the, the Linux kernel, a root file system flash drive, and a set of input flash drives and one output flash drive. So everything in the Cartesian machine is configurable. Actually, um, the, the app developer is able to choose the amount of RAM and number, position, and lengths of the, uh, of the drives uh, over a 64-bit physical address space of the machine. Everything is configurable by the DApp developer according to the DApp needs. So for the Cartesian machine templates, of course, the input drives are empty uh, at the beginning because these input drives are gonna be replaced by drives that are gonna be fulfilled with the actual information that is coming at runtime when the DApp is running. Here we have a sample of how we, we could instantiate a Cartesian machine using the command line interface. So you can easily see that through this command, uh, one can pass a ROM image, a RAM image, specify the, the amount of RAM uh, the root file system is giving through a flash drive. And when the machine boots, it just executes uh, the sample command uh, ls slash bin, and then it halts. The Cartesian machine uh, provides other ways to, for one to manipulate it from the outside. So uh, we also have a Lua programming language interface, a C++ interface, and most importantly, a gRPC interface that's fundamental for the Cartesian machine to work uh, inside the nodes uh, and interacting with the blockchain. Uh, from the inside of the Cartesian machine, you know, the, the, the program sees a full computer in a full Linux operating system. So it doesn't know that it, it is in an emulated environment at all. Let's give it a break for some time to talk about some uh, cool application that we delivered uh, at the beginning of this year. Crypts is a tower defense game in which the players compete uh, against each other for the high score. It's fully decentralized. It runs on Ethereum, thanks to Cartesi. Uh, what's cool about Crypts is that, is that it involves uh, heavy processing. You have billions or even trillions of microprocessor instruction steps that are required to run uh, in order to verify a gameplay. And of course, doing that on chain would be impossible due to the computational limits of the blockchain. The second important thing is that uh, Crypts was implemented using TypeScript and it does, among other things, compression and decompression of files, which of course would also be impossible to do uh, on Ethereum because the concept of files is not there. So here we have a fully decentralized tower defense game uh, involving heavy computation and mainstream software stacks and OS resources uh, totally working on Ethereum thanks to Cartesian. So if you want to try, you can just download, it's open source. You can even use it as a template to build your own game. Let's go back to how Cartesian works. So we spent some time talking about the RISC-5 VM architecture which is one of the pillars of the technology. And the other pillar is the local consensus protocol. I'd like to spend some more time talking about the local consensus protocol. It's a very important aspect of the system. If you were to develop a game 
uh, on Ethereum or any blockchain supporting smart contracts. Uh, and let's say Alice and Bob would challenge each other on this game. Then for every, every single game move that Alice or Bob do, uh, it becomes a transaction in the Ethereum blockchain and that transaction with the uh, entailed computation needs to be emulated by around 12,000 full nodes in the network. Uh, and of course, the 12,000 nodes are not interested at all in the results of the match between Alice and Bob that doesn't concern them. In today's talk, I would like to explore how decentralization and self-sovereign identities can help in saving the planet. I'm Micha Rohn, the CTO of the Energy Web Foundation. My job is to enable the creation of a decentralized infrastructure to decarbonize the grid. I love my job. The Energy Web Foundation was created in late 2016 with the mission, well, you probably guessed it, to create a decentralized infrastructure to decarbonize the grid. The first backers were the likes of Shell and TEPCO and EDF and Singapore Power Group, big corporates. In the second and third wave in 2017 and 2018, more corporates and more startups were added to form our ecosystem today of over 100 large and small companies who support our mission. Let's briefly go over the transformation our electricity grid is going through. In the past, energy markets were very simple. You had a utility creating electricity and a customer purchasing it, and that's it. And we are in transition, actually, into a system in which many consumer will become prosumers, which mean producers and consumers, and the grid will be physically decentralized. This decentralization is a big challenge for utilities because they're not used to it. Another effect of decentralization <coughs> is that the spending power is shifting from utilities to presumers. According to the International Energy Agency, in 10 years, the presumer, EV drivers, homeowners, small businesses, will spend three times more than utilities and 15 times more than today on energy resources. This shift comes mainly from the fact that more and more of our everyday appliances like cars, water heaters, heat pumps, air conditioners, washing machines, well, to name just a few, will be able to participate in energy markets. Well, let's go back to IT. This is our energy web decentralized operating system the EW DOS for short. It has three layers from button to top, trust, utility, and toolkits. The trust layer is the energy web chain, which went live in June last year. It is an Ethereum clone with approval authority consensus, publicly usable with a permission validation scheme. So you can purchase energy web tokens today on three exchanges, actually five exchanges, and start building applications on the energy web chain. The utility layer contains the building blocks that will allow application developers to seamlessly write and deploy their decentralized applications without the need to provision infrastructure. The toolkits are the use cases we the Energy Web Foundation 
is working on to decarbonize the grid. The, the focus of this talk is on identity and how it makes toolkits easier to use. I will go into more detail on how identities work, speci specifically about authentication and authorization. In order to give this a bit more context, I will also talk a little about our Flex Toolkit for flexibility markets. As you might know, creating an identity is a matter of generating a key pair and anchoring it on chain. It's that simple. You can do it from the comfort of your desk. Once a user or organization has an identity, they can create and issue claims. Creating a claim is done by the user who holds the information they want to have validated. Claim issuance means approving the data provided by the user. While you can issue a claim to anyone, only the owner of the identity is capable of saving the claim in the DID document. And this is very important because it makes it impossible to write something into someone else's DID document without their consent. Looking at a concrete example, Alice wants to convince her utility, the DSO in this picture, bottom left, that she has installed a battery in her home and that, uh, that can store the energy from her rooftop solar. And she wants to participate in flexibility markets with this battery. So Alice starts by creating a claim that she owns the battery and sends that claim to this device. The device contains a secure element with a private key that is capable of signing messages and because the claim is correctly formed, the claim is issued back to Alice. Alice can now store the claim that the battery has issued to her in IPFS. She might want to encrypt the claim in order to obfuscate its content, which might be a good idea because IPFS is publicly available. But simply storing in IPFS is not enough. The claim must be anchored on chain to give it legitimacy. Alice is now ready to prove her, to her utility that she owns a battery and presents the link to the claim to the DSO. Obviously, the DSO does not trust Alice and needs to verify the claim. The DSO fetches the claim from IPFS and read, reads checks in, uh, in the on-chain registry that the claim has not been revoked and that the signature is correct. The DSO must trust the battery's claims and it can do so because the battery owns a claim in its own DID document that it was issued, that it was created by an OEM. And this OEM is someone the DSO trusts. And by delegation of authority, the DSO trusts the battery. A DID document can be compared to a passport in which all the attributes of a person or device are stored. The attributes might originate from multiple parties and together give a precise picture of the capabilities of the device and permissions of the person. Um, the added benefit is that any application can trust a user's claim and thus there is no need for multiple onboardings. Because the claims are owned and held by the user themselves, it is the user and not the application developer who can decide to who the claims can be presented. And this is actually the biggest shift from 
centralize authorization schemes to decentralized authorization schemes. It is the user and not the application that can decide to who authorization schemes can be presented. The DID document and the claim it contains can be used to authenticate or verify that a user has access to the private key and that this private key has not been compromised. It is much more secure than a username and password scheme. Once the user has been authenticated, an application can actually authorize the user to do stuff because of the claims that the DID document contains and the proofs that the user is able to present that they have access to certain functionality. And again, any application can make use of any of authorization that you as the user have received. So let's talk a bit about how we use DIDs in our Flex Toolkit. The Flex Toolkit allows a consortium of DSOs and TSOs, which are the distribution service operator and the transmission service operators, or low voltage and high voltage system operators, to create a shared flexibility market. Flexibility markets allow to incentivize prosumers to help balance the grid. And this effort is required, and it is performed today already, but not by prosumers, but it is required for us to enjoy electricity at a stable voltage and a stable frequency, which is really important for our appliances to work. In our Flex Toolkit, we have created a hierarchy of trust. The government, in this picture, the authority, on the left hand side of the chart is responsible is the root authority and they're the ones who issue the claims to the DSO and TSO that this is the role they play in the system. The TSO actually trusts the judgment of the multiple DSOs that it sells electricity to. They have a contractual agreement and it is okay for them to trust one another. It is the DSO who is in charge of vetting installers, approving OEMs, and it is a DSO that has the commercial relationship with the presumer. And the presumer is the one who owns the IoT device, and the installer is the one who um, certifies that the IoT device has been installed correctly, and the OEM certifies that the IoT device, let's say a battery, has certain capabilities and all these data can be trusted because the parties that issue the claims can be trusted. We have developed a mobile application which allows the presumer to take ownership of their devices and the installer to verify the installation. This is important to reduce the onboarding costs for devices and presumers. Once a device, a decentralized energy resource in our jargon, or a DER, has been onboarded, it can send offers to the marketplace. It sends offers to deliver flexibility for a 15-minute delivery period. And it is the device itself, and not a delegate of the device, that sends the offer. This offer is signed by the device's private key, which is held on a secure element, on a secure hardware element, like a hardware wallet. But the device being dumb, it needs to be instructed how to create the offer, or what the parameters of the offers are. It is the owner of the device that can delegate the power or the authority to instruct the device on how to make its offers to an intelligence provider or an aggregator or whoever can provide this service. Th this is really important 
uh, for the device to make good decisions and good offers. And it can be a competitive market for the future. Once the offers have been purchased, which is not guaranteed, of course, it's a marketplace, the DSO or TSO who has purchased the offer can use the acquired privilege to direct the DER to do their bidding, either consume more energy or release energy into the network. So if there is a glut of energy, the sun is shining too bright, there is too much solar, let the batteries charge and once a cloud passes uh, between the sun and the solar panel, let the batteries discharge. At the end of the 15 minute delivery period, um, the settlement is done. So the payment is done. This is of course done on chain, on the energy web chain. And the offer is settled according to the price that has been agreed on. If you would like more information, here is a collection of links pertaining to the subject. And everything we do at Energy Web Foundation being open source, you are free to go on GitHub and, uh, well, explore the source code for yourself. Thank you very much for listening so far and have a great conference. Thank you.